Good morning, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to today's Explore Classroom Hangout. My name is Joe Grabowski from National Geographic, and I will be your host for today. Uh, for those who have been following along this month, uh, you know that we have been looking at conservation around the world. So talking to different scientists uh, and explorers who are conserving not only habitats, uh, but uh, the amazing uh, wildlife that you can find in those habitats. So before we meet uh, today's guest, we're gonna take a quick moment to look at National Geographic's Mapmaker Interactive and get a feel for where everyone's joining us live from today. So just give me a moment to share my screen here. There we go. All right, so you should see a map coming up nice front and center. I am at the Red X, I'm at National Geographic headquarters in Washington, D.C. today. And if we start to back up a little bit on the map, we can get a feel for where some of our classrooms are joining us. So we have classroom in Canada today in Toronto, Ontario. We have a classroom in Maine, another classroom joining us in Rhode Island. And if we back up just a little bit more, we've got another Canadian classroom joining us in Manitoba. We've got another classroom in California hanging out with us. And if we jump across the ocean, uh, we can see that we have Emily joining us in Ireland. And I tried to pick something that looked kind of peat mossy. I don't know if that was a good choice, but I think that's the closest that we had. So as I come back from the screen share, I just want to give any classrooms who are tuning in on YouTube a reminder that you can still get in on the action. There's a chat sidebar on the right. Let us know where you are, what grade you are. Send us in some questions and we'll work some of those in. And then of course, any classrooms, whether you're joining us live on camera or you are on YouTube, take some pictures, post them on Twitter with the hashtag Explore Classroom and tag at Nat Geo Education because we always love to see classrooms in action. All right, back to the main event. Really excited. We have Emily Toner joining us today. She's a soil geographer exploring the scientific and cultural significance of soils around the world. So for her 2018-2019 Fulbright National Geographic Digital Storytelling Fellowship, she's in Ireland researching and writing about the Irish relationship to peat bogs. So peat bogs are rich in unexpectedly political spaces where carbon density is significant for climate change mitigation. She also spent time in Uganda where she learned that culture drives the framework which people understand and interact with soil, which is one of their key natural resources. So Emily, it is so awesome to have you joining us live today. We're excited to learn a little bit more about you and your work, and then we're gonna turn it over to the classrooms to fire away with some questions. Awesome, thank you so much, Joe. And hello everybody from coast to coast out there. Hi. I hope you're doing well, and I'm really, really excited to be with you today. So again, my name is Emily Toner, and I am a soil geographer. So within conservation, you might be talking about plants and animals and different systems, and today we're gonna talk about what's going on underneath your feet in the soil. So I'm gonna go ahead and share my own screen, and I have some photographs to show you and different things to share from here in Ireland. So let me go into presentation mode. So again, here I am in Ireland just saying hello to you from Ireland. And um, I am here as a Fulbright National Geographic Fellow. So I'm actually here for nine months. And this is me leaving Indianapolis, Indiana, a place that wasn't represented on the map today, kind of right in the middle of the country and leaving with my luggage, and that was in September. So I've been here since then exploring bogs. And so I wondered if any of you had been on a bog. So in case you haven't, I thought I would go ahead and right off the bat show you what a bog looks like. So those are my rubber boots, and I'm standing on a mound of moss, which you're gonna hear a lot more about. And here's what it looks like. So now you've seen your first Irish bog, and you're going to know quite a bit more about bogs before we're done today. But before we started, we had that map already, but I just wanted to point out how far away I am from most of you today. So you're over there in the blue continent of North America. I'm over here in Europe in the red continent. And within Europe, I'm actually in the now red shaded country there, Ireland. And Ireland is an island. 
So it's completely surrounded by water. And on the west so coast, that's the Atlantic Ocean, which some of you are very close to on the east coast of the United States. And then on the other side of Ireland, on the east side, it's the Irish Sea. And so because it's right there on the edge of the ocean, it gets a lot, a lot of rain, which is something you might have heard about Ireland. It's really, really wet and rainy here. And that has a lot to do with why we have so many bogs here as well. Some people say that Ireland looks like a bear on its side. So I thought I would just show you that some people think that Ireland looks a little bit like a bear. So it's a beautiful, beautiful country here. This is on top of a, a bog that happens to be on a mountain, so you can see out across the landscape. And Ireland is really known for, in addition to being wet and rainy, for being very green. And so um, it has mosses and trees and vines that grow year round and stay green. And here is one of the mosses that grows in a bog. And that's a green moss I'm showing you, but there are actually many different colors of moss. So you can see a red poking through there. And here's a very bright red moss with a little bit of a gold moss too. So moss is something else I'm gonna to talk to you about today. And I wanted to show you when you walk through a bog, what it looks like to step into moss. So moss is really, really soft and um, can be very deep in bogs. And so it's a really cool experience to walk into a bog. Here's what it looks like. So when you step into that moss, you really squish down into it. Um, and so since I'm going to talk a lot about soil and sort of not about the plants and animals in a bog, I wanted to give you one quick glimpse of those other things in bogs in Ireland and what they look like. So here's a colleague of mine who, I, who came out to the bog with me, and he lives in Dublin. His name's Gary. He's the one on the left. And it was his very first time walking through a bog. And I asked him to pick up a few things, put them in a glass jar and tell me what he noticed in a bog. So here's what he noticed. And I wanted to give you a look at it before we kind of dive down into the soil. What can you see on the surface of a bog? So here's what Gary- And my name is Gary Brown and I am from Dublin. So I was given a lovely little glass jar Really just popping in anything that stood out. I have a little cranberry, which I will eat uh, on the way home. It's a little snack for the way home. Um, the cranberries are very interesting in that they're literally dotted in the most random places. I thought they'd be in, in a bunch, but you have to really go searching for them. Then I found a, an old snail shell, really nice colors. It's like a, a light pink, it's all cracked. And then I found a mixture of fungi and algae which is really interesting. looks a bit like coral underwater. Um, and then my rosemary, the rosemary is really interesting because you obviously see rosemary at home or when you get it in the shops, but this is like a completely different color, like a dark violet color. And then a nice little flower at the top, pink flower at the top. What was that matchstick one as well? Matchstick lichen. Matchstick lichen, the, the red and the matchstick That's lichen tiny. is so bright and very, very cool. So that's a little bit about what you might notice walking around in a bog. There are shells from snails that live there. There are different types of plants, some called lichens. There are berries. He mentioned the cranberries. There are a couple types of wild edible berries on the bog. And then, um, of course, lots and lots of moss. So those are all of the things that will eventually be sinking into the bog and becoming the soil that I'm going to tell you more about. So I've been here since September. This is me standing on a bog so you can get a good look at it, what it looks like, really flat and kind of wide open. And um, I came here in search of a very special type of soil that's under the bogs. It's called peat soil. And um, you can see it there behind me in the photograph, really, really dark in color, really deep in this case, in this bog. And then the moss and all of those plants that we were just looking at 
Those are growing on the very surface of the soil behind me. So they're the vegetation and the living layer that's on top of the bog. And then the soil is what you see dark descending down below that vegetation. And in some cases, it can be um, as much as 30 to 40 feet deep in a bog. So why did I come here in search of this cool soil? Well, it's because I love soil. Soil is an incredibly special part of our planet. It's one of our most important resources. And so I thought I might tell you a little bit about how I learned about soil and what I did before I got here to Ireland to study it. So I'm originally from Iowa, which is colored in red there on the map. And that's where I went to college at Iowa State University and studied agriculture. And then I went up to Wisconsin, just next door to Iowa, to study geography and look at more of the way that culture is layered into soil. So here I am in Colorado digging a pit of soil. And one of the things that I learned in studying soil is how complex and how much variety there is across the world. So I wonder if you can look at this soil and think, does it look like the soil that's in, in your communities near your house maybe, or if you ever go on hikes or see a field out in the country, you might start looking at the soil to see what color is it. Or in this case, here I am in Spain, is it really sticky if you touch it? This is a very, very high clay soil that has a lot of stickiness and red color to it. So as I got more curious about soil, I learned you can actually measure things about the soil, a lot of different things. So here I am in a soil pit in Colorado that I helped dig, and I'm measuring nutrients. So what are nutrients? They're all the things that you and I need to grow and also plants need to grow. So you can measure calcium, potassium, and also you can measure carbon. So I want you to remember that you can, rem that you can measure carbon in soil because we're going to come back to that. So all of the plants that we grow, and in this case, here we are growing lettuce in the soil, they need these nutrients. And I wonder if any of you have ever grown a vegetable. So here's my friend Amy. She's about to plant a tomato plant into the soil. Have you ever grown a vegetable or a plant? If you have, you know that it needs quite a few things. And then eventually, sometimes you can eat the plants that we grow, like the vegetables. So I wanted to point out to you why soil is so important for food and even for something like pizza. So if you think about the parts of a pizza, we have the crust and the sauce and the cheese and the toppings. And all of that somehow came out of the soil. So in the case of the crust, the wheat is likely made from wheat flour. The wheat is a plant that grew in the soil, and that's how it became a big wheat plant that we could harvest and turn into flour. The sauce, the main vegetable, you can see in the back corner of that photograph is a tomato. That grew in the soil. And even the cheese, which came from milk, which probably in this case came from a cow, that cow ate plants that came from the soil. So even pizza we, is connected to the soil and we couldn't have a slice of pizza without healthy soil to grow our plants in. So that's one main reason why soil is so important. But the other reason um, and the big, big reason that I came to Ireland is because of what soil can hold. And do you remember when I said that we could measure carbon? I'm gonna tell you about how the bogs of Ireland and the soil here, the peat soil, are really important storers and holders of carbon. So here's my friend Amy again. She came over to Ireland to visit me, and I'm showing her some peat soil, the type of soil that's under the bog. Now, one thing I wanted to point out to you about soil is that it takes a really long time to, to form or to grow and add new soil to a landscape. So in the case of this peat soil, it actually grows at one millimeter per year. So to get an idea then of how long that soil that Amy's touching took to form, I want you to hold out your finger and look at your index finger and how wide it is. 
So that's probably about one centimeter, I'm guessing, which is 10 millimeters. So if you have one centimeter within your finger and peat soil takes one millimeter per year to grow, you could actually grow the width of your finger in 10 years. Now, if you think about how tall you are, you let's say you're 10 years old, 12 years old, you've grown your whole height in that amount of time, but soil has only grown to the height of the width of your finger because it takes a really long time to grow. It's very slow. It takes a long time for it to build up. So the soil that Amy's touching is probably about 50 centimeters tall. That means that took 500 years to form that soil. So the main takeaway there is just that soil grows a lot slower than we do, and it's not actually going to grow very much in our own lifetime. So we sort of have to, we have to use what we already have here. And if we lose some of it, we probably won't be able to build it back up very quickly. So when you look at soil, you kind of see the solid parts of it. You know, in this case, you can see a big worm in the middle, but you can also see some roots growing, some sand, maybe some other sorts of minerals there. You really focus on the solid parts of soil. But actually, soil is half solid and half water and air. So that part that you can touch, including the roots, including that worm and all the minerals, that's on the bottom half of this pie chart showing you what soil is made up of with the mineral and organic part. And soil is actually one quarter air, 25%, and also 25% water. Now that's a normal soil. The soil in a bog is actually really different than that. It has so much water that it's actually 95% water. So I wanted to show you what that means, coming back to what it's like to walk across a bog. So when you're walking across a bog, you're basically almost walking across water because a bog is 95% water. So what does that look like when you put your foot into it? Here, I'll show you what, what it looked like when I was walking through this bog. So can you see how my boot, all I had to do was press into the surface and it's already showing you water. It's because the bog is just brimming with water. So I'll sh show you another um, slideshow that I made with a photographer who came out with me to try to document the bogs. So she came out with her equipment, but she actually had never been in a bog. And she, I asked her to describe what it was like to walk across the bog and on top of all of that water. And here's what she said. Before I got to Ireland this week, I had never seen a bog in my life. My name is Jen Guyton and I'm a Fulbright National Geographic Digital Storytelling Fellow. When we first actually walked out onto a bog, the first thing I noticed was how spongy it felt under my feet. It was just the weirdest feeling to walk um, over a bog. It was kind of, it was kind of like walking on foam almost, the way it kind of squishes beneath your feet, but you also hear this like watery, sloshy sound as you walk. And you can see the moss kind of depressing beneath your boots. So I guess you can get a sense of how wet bogs are. And I really wanted to make that point to you because it matters for the soil and what happens in the soil. So sphagnum moss, I thought that might be a new term to you. So I wanted to put it up here on the screen. And I also wanted to invite you to repeat it after me. So I'm gonna say it and then just try to repeat it after me so that you know how to say this new plant. So sphagnum moss. 
Let's try it one more time. Can you repeat it after me? Sphagnum moss. So that's what you see on the screen, the sphagnum moss, and it's the primary plant growing in bogs. So if, when you talk about the soil that's under bogs, a lot of it is dead sphagnum moss that has grown over the years or centuries and died and sunk into that watery bog. Um, I'm putting a glass of milk up here because one fun fact about sphagnum moss is if you took this glass of milk and you also scooped a similar glass into a bog and took out a glass of sphagnum moss, between the milk and the moss, there's actually more water in the sphagnum than in the milk. So just to show you, even though the moss looks like a plant, there's actually a huge, huge amount of water. And sphagnum moss can hold 20 times its own weight in water. So all of this moss and the other plants are growing in the bog, and when they sink down, they actually don't decompose like a normal plant. So I wanted to point out a normal plant, one that you're not seeing in a bog, a big oak tree, or I think this might be a maple tree. And when those leaves fall, normally what happens out in, in nature is that the leaves would then decompose. So they go from their bright green, maybe they change a color in the fall, and eventually kind of turn brown and brittle and break away, and microorganisms decompose them. Well, in a bog, that's not what happens. Once the moss dies and sinks down, because of all that water that you saw, they don't decompose. They kind of rest there. They get a little bit darker. They break down a little bit. For the most part, though, the plants that sink and die and kind of become part of the soil in a bog, they don't decompose. And that's really important for what that means in the soil. So I wanted to show you what the soil really looks like. So here's my friend Amy again. She is going to reach out and grab a piece of this soil and tell you what it feels like. What does it feel like, Amy? Mm, it's kind of damp, pretty spongy. Yeah, yeah, this one's pretty good. Feels like 5,000 years of plant history. So Amy said that right at the end, it feels like 5,000 years of plant history. And she said that because in a bog, you can actually hold these plants for thousands of years without them fully decomposing. So what does that mean for carbon? That's what I really wanted to share with you. And that's what I came to Ireland to find out more about. In this image, you see CO2, which is how you can write shorthand for carbon dioxide. Well, I wanted to make the connection between that peat soil and carbon dioxide and climate change for you. So how do we get carbon dioxide getting into our atmosphere? It happens in many different ways. You know, when, we, um, when our cars are burning gasoline, carbon dioxide comes out of its exhaust. When you burn coal for electricity, carbon dioxide comes out. And I'm going to back away from bogs for a moment, but I'll come back to them and just talk about the link between carbon dioxide and climate change. So all of that carbon dioxide that we have coming out of our cars and factories and other ways that we emit carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases, they're adding up in our atmosphere. And so this is just a graph to show you know, from 1970 up until today, and you could have gone back a lot further in history, that carbon dioxide continues to increase in the atmosphere. And so why is that of concern to us? Well, when the carbon dioxide continues to build up in the atmosphere and other greenhouse gases, it really changes the climate. It changes our air and it changes the climate in the way that our planet is functioning. And so as we have more and more carbon dioxide coming out and building up as this graph is showing, it is actually changing the planet and the way we live. So what does that mean for us? 
It means that all of those plants that are grown to make our food, like this pizza, they might start struggling to grow if we let the carbon dioxide build up too much. They've evolved for a long time to grow in maybe specific types of climates like rainfall, how much rain a plant needs, the temperature it can grow in, and they might start struggling to produce the food that we need if we continue to allow the carbon dioxide to build up in the atmosphere. So what does all this have to do with bogs? Well, all of that plant matter, all of the moss and the other plants that are growing and dying in bogs, sinking into the watery surface and then not decomposing, they're actually taking a lot of carbon with them. So this bog that you're looking at could be maybe four meters deep, maybe deeper. That would represent 4,000 plus years of plant growth and history. And all of that carbon, as long as this bog is wet, continues to lay in the ground. So here's a beautiful photo of some sphagnum moss. As it grows, it's taking carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere, the opposite of what we're doing when we drive our car and we release carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. These plants grow and take it with them down into the soil and it stays there. So one of the amazing facts that I'll share with you as we wrap up here and go to your questions is that peat soil, the type of soil under bogs, all over the world, it covers about 3% of our land, but yet it holds more carbon than all plants combined, including rainforests. So one of the things that people talk about when they're concerned about the climate is how do we slow down those emissions of carbon dioxide that we have that are coming out of our cars and our factories? And how do we hold the carbon down in the natural environment, whether that's growing trees to take carbon out of the air or other solutions. And I just wanted to point out the hugely significant role that bogs can play because of how wet they are, because of the fact that they have these plants growing, dying, and not decomposing in the watery peat soil down below. So um, I'll leave you with one final thought about the bogs of Ireland then before we go to questions. In Ireland, you would think that this beautiful watery peat soil filled landscape was maybe safe and a holder of carbon that we could count on as we think about climate change and how to react to it. But actually most bogs in Ireland are being stripped of their moss and vegetation and drained. So the only time that they're actually holding that carbon and wet is when they're sort of left in their natural state. But in Ireland, see this long white line tracing down the middle of this photograph, that's actually a drain. The, the bright color of it is water reflecting light. And so this is what a lot of bogs look like in Ireland. They no longer have moss on top of them. They no longer are wet on the surface. They're actually drained. And they're doing this so that they can carve out that peat soil. And it's actually used as a fuel. So you can see it here stacked up in piles. Um, so I just wanted to leave you with that thought that, that bogs, there are these incredible places. They're wet. They're spongy. They have moss. They have all of these interesting things growing in them. And they have a huge, huge amount of carbon under the surface, but they are also being harvested and being drained, and they may not be able to provide that function forever um, because they're being used for other purposes. So I hope now when you see this photograph that you saw of me in the beginning, showing you a selfie with soil, that you can think and notice a little bit more about that soil, the peat soil in the bog behind me than you might have at first glance. So with that, I will stop screen sharing and go back to you, Joe. All right, and All right. let's give it a second for you to come back. Try hitting the green button again. I don't think it went through. All right, you're back, we got gotcha. you. All right, well, Emily, thanks so much for sharing. Um, I had no idea that uh, peat bogs were holding so much carbon and 
you know, it's it's kind of scary to think that they're being harvested and that carbon's being released. So that's a lot of carbon that's being stored and then potentially released back into the atmosphere. All right, well, let's meet some of our classrooms and let them fire away with some questions. Uh, let's see, I'm gonna go to Toronto, Ontario first. Uh, Mrs. Javon has her class with her. Let me turn their microphone on. How are we doing, Toronto? <laughs> All right, looks like a big group in Toronto. Who's got a question for us? Anybody have a question? Daphne, nice and loud, stand up. What is the best soil to plant? Oh, to use to plant? Yeah. So what is the best soil that to use to plant? Okay, great question, Daphne. So there, because there are all sorts of different types of soil out there, so some soils are going to be more suitable, better quality for plants than others. But the other thing you have to keep in mind is it actually depends on what you want to grow. So let's say you wanted to grow a tomato plant, like I was mentioning with that pizza. You'd probably want a soil that has a nice... Um, sort of medium texture to it. So you'd want some sand, some clay, some organic matter in there, sort of a brownish color, maybe a darker brown to black color. But if you wanted to grow a cactus, you'd want a very different soil. So that would want a drier soil, maybe a sandier soil, and one that just has very different texture to it. So I hope that helps you a little bit. Depends on what you want to grow. Uh, but if you want to grow vegetables, you can certainly make a good soil up for that. All right. Great question to get us started. Let's jump to another spot in Canada. Let's go to Thompson, Manitoba. Mrs. Oster's class is hanging out with us. Let's get their microphone on. How are we doing, Manitoba? Good. What's your favorite thing about a bog? Oh, my gosh. I, I'm tempted to answer the soil. Uh, but I might say one of my favorite things about being here in the bogs is actually all of the frogs I've seen. So Ireland actually only has three types of amphibians. They have one type of toad, one type of frog, and one type of newt. And the frogs that they have live in the bogs here. So I've actually seen them go from baby tadpoles all the way growing up to adults, and it's really fun to watch. All right, very cool. Uh, let's see, where should we go next? Let's go to Mrs. Loya's group. They're hanging out with us in Danville, California. Looks like some grade fours hanging out there. Let's get their microphone turned on. How are we doing, California? Good. Okay, EJ, what's your question? What fuel does peat soil make? Oh, great question. Thank you for that. So peat soil, is um, used in a few different ways for fuel. Now that photograph that I showed that had what looked like logs or they're called sods of, of peat soil, that's actually called turf here in Ireland and people burn turf in their fireplace just like they would burn wood maybe at home for you. So it makes the type of fuel that you can cut into logs and burn in your fireplace but they also use it in big power plants to make electricity. So that one of the last photographs I showed with a big drain down the middle of the bog, that one was being harvested for power plants and they actually take huge truckloads of soil and dump them into a burner and burn it for fuel that way too. All right, another awesome question. Let's see. Let's go now. Mr. Swan's group is hanging out with us. They're in Rhode Island. Looks like some seventh graders hanging out there. Let's get that microphone turned on. Oh. How are we doing, seventh graders? Woo! What's up? Very good. Right. Who's up? Me. So go ahead, Danielle. Nice what? and loud. Everyone else listen. What's the strongest dirt to build with? Okay, did you, let me make sure I heard your question. Did you say what is the strongest dirt to build with? Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, that's a great question because the way I've been talking about soil here is really more about it in its natural environment. 
But a lot of the time we're in soil, like you are in the classroom, like I am here in my house, that's been pushed down underneath a building. And to do that and to build a good building, you need to have particular conditions in the soil. So often what they will do is what's called compacting it. And they really, you know how I said it was 25% water, 25% air, 50% solids. They kind of want to squish out all of that air and water. And so the best type of soil for building is usually the one that you can pack down and smash the most which is not usually what I do or think about with soil, but it's a great question because a lot of our neighborhoods and schools and communities are built on top of soil that's been smashed for building. All right, so I wanna work in a quick question from online from Florida, and they're wondering where else in the world could you find bogs? Oh, great question. So in, did you say that that one's from Florida, Joe? Yeah. So you actually have a type of bog, I'm going to say. You have a swamp in Florida in the Everglades. And um, it, well, if you zoom out from bogs to one category larger, so I was talking about peat soil, bogs and swamps and different types of um, wet places that build up peat soil are actually called peatlands. And there are a lot in Canada where um, some of you are calling in from today. And in Florida, you actually have peatlands there in the Everglades. So there are a lot of bogs and peatlands all over the country. Um, and you might have one nearby you, so you should check it out and see if you can go visit a bog. Very cool. Uh, let's follow up in Toronto. Do you guys have a second question? Uh, Toma, you wanna come closer? What's your question? Is are there any other like places with bogs in Europe? Oh. That's a great question. Yes, there are quite a few places in Europe with bogs. Um, so countries that would have naturally had bogs include the Netherlands, Germany, Finland, Estonia. Um, and a few others, but unfortunately, in some places like the Netherlands, they have harvested all of their bogs completely down to the last hunk of peat soil. So in Netherlands, the only little bits of bog they have left are ones that they've tried to rebuild. But the country that has the most bogs in Europe is Finland. All right, great question. Let's swing back to Manitoba, see if they have a follow-up for us. How many bogs is there in Ireland? Oh, I'm so glad you asked that because I forgot to say it in my presentation. Ireland is one-fifth covered in peat soil, so 20% of the country is peatland and most of that is bog um so ireland i also forgot to say is about the size of indiana so it's probably bigger than well i'm not remembering where everybody is but for the most part ireland's going to be bigger than the states that you're in except for california and maybe some of the provinces in canada but um if you can in any way, imagine the size of Indiana. I know that's not everybody's point of reference. It's about one fifth the size of that. That's how many bogs there are here. All right, and one more swing into California. If you guys have a question. Um, when did you start liking moss and why? <clears throat> oh, thank you. Um, I really got to know moss when I started coming to Ireland to go hiking. There are so many beautiful rocks and trails that are really, really deep with moss. So um, I just think it's really beautiful. So maybe next time when you're outside, you can look around because there are lots of urban mosses as well. You might see some on the sidewalk, but when you see a whole forest covered in moss, it's a pretty incredible thing. And I think when I saw that is when I started loving moss. All right, well, classrooms, first of all, thank you so much for hanging out with us today. Awesome, awesome questions. Uh, Emily, thank you for sharing that story of soil with us, especially uh, in Ireland. I think a lot of people overlook soil, overlook places like peat bogs, 
but really they contain a huge amount of history and really do a huge service for our planet in a really small space. Thanks so much, Joe. It's been a really fun and pleasurable time to be here with you all. Thank you so much. All right. I'm going to turn the microphones on, boys and girls. If you want to give a big goodbye and thank you, then we'll sign off for today. <laughs>